Matthew 5, 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Uh, tonight I'd like to teach on this theme, clearing relational clutter. Please be seated. Thank you for thinking about the Word of God. Amen. As I was uh, preparing for this message, I was reminded of a Wednesday night Bible study. I, I look back to see when it was, Wednesday, uh, June 12, 2019, I taught on the subject, I don't hate nobody. And that's a direct quote, word for word, from the former, the late Brother J.T. Pugh. And if you'd like to study more or think more about what I'm teaching tonight, I would recommend you go back and watch or listen to that message. I will touch on some of the same scriptures, but not the same message. I, I look back and forth and... But I really felt led of the Lord to continue the theme from Sunday, a time to throw away, and that I needed to teach tonight on relationships. Now, clutter is having a lot of things in a messy state, especially things that are not useful or necessary. Clutter. Stuff that you don't need, you don't use, it's just messy. And to clutter is to fill or cover with scattered or disordered things that impede movement or reduce effectiveness. Uh, I don't preach from a dictionary, but when you use a word, I like to know what that word means. And clutter may mean something to you a little different than someone else. But I thought it was interesting that clutter is not just a bunch of stuff, it's stuff that's in your way. It's stuff that's slowing you down. It's stuff that's impeding your progress. And in this Bible study, I want to focus on clearing relational clutter. Specifically, I want to address the, cl the clutter of unresolved conflicts and relational baggage. My focus is on discarding the accumulation of hurts, wounds, offenses, and even sins in our lives. So, that's the theme tonight. I know you know this, but relationships matter to God. You know that you can't take your stuff to heaven. You can try to take a person to heaven. It's up to their will, but you can influence them to go. But now, no matter how much... You influence your pet to go to heaven. I'm sorry to break the news to you, but according to the Bible, I don't think all dogs go to heaven. Unfortunately, I love dogs. The Bible said without our dogs, so I don't know. Anyway, but people go to heaven. Relationships matter to God. He wired us for relationships. And relationships are reflective of our relationship with God, human relationships are reflective of our relationship with God. Obviously, your relationship with God is of primary importance. I want to add, and I don't really want to teach on this so much tonight, but I believe that you have an intrapersonal relationship. How you see yourself, how you think of yourself, how you treat yourself. It matters how you view yourself. It's a reflection of how you view God because you were created after his likeness and in your image. And if you hate yourself, you may struggle with the one who created you. And you may wonder what's wrong with him, that he made you like you are. We know that we are complete in Christ and our personal wholeness that I feel strongly about and talk about. Fairly often, our personal wholeness grows out of a right relationship with God. 
Complete in Christ, incomplete without Him. And when you're incomplete, then you are insecure. And insecure people, people who are controlled by insecurity, typically have unhealthy relationships with other people. And very often with God. They struggle believing that God can love them. And so they live under constant condemnation, fearing that they never measure up. We know that, and I know this is not a, a new idea to you, but I jokingly say I'm a recovering perfectionist in my personality. I'm a perfectionist. But I recognize that I'm complete in Christ, that when my heart condemns us, God is greater than my heart. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ that makes me right with Him, not the performance that of any given day in my life. It's not how much I do or accomplish that makes me valuable to God. He loved me when I was dead in my sins. On my worst day, He made me worthy by His blood. So it's not my performance that earns the love of God in my life and allows me to be whole and complete in Christ. Amen. So if you're controlled by insecurity, then you're prone to unhealthy relationships. I could say always, but always is a lot. Incomplete people typically are operating out of an emotional and spiritual deficit. They're in the red. They're trying to get out of the red. So they're needy. They need constant affirmation, approval, accumulation. They need more and more, but the harder they try, the behinder they get because it is not an accumulation of applause or possessions or status in life, achievement, that causes you to ever be complete. It is being content that Jesus Christ covered your sins with his blood and he made you accepted in the beloved and you are accepted by him. You can be resolved with your imperfections, knowing that you're complete by, in Jesus Christ. But a person who's uh, operating out of a deficit emotionally and spiritually, they typically use other people to uh, try to accrue worth and overcome their deficits. Materialism is one of the symptoms of incompleteness, self-rejection. And over appearance on, over attention rather on appearance, physical appearance, and and what would be the symptoms of success, but not I'm not symptoms, but the signs of success. Maybe not ever having the substance. That's why so many people cheat and rob and steal and cut corners to try to accumulate out of greed, materialism, the desire to have and be something that they are not. Amen. Now, your relationship with other people, I know you know this, but your relationships with other people is very important to Almighty God. I'm going to Matthew chapter 22 now, Matthew 22, 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. These are major religious groups, sects, S-E-C-T. And so they come to him. And one of them, which was a, a lawyer, a theologian, asked Jesus a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, your entire being. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, this is one of the amazing verse to me. On these two commandments hang all the law. And the prophets. The first commandment, of course, is that we love God with our entire being. If you stop and think about it, it almost takes your breath away to think of what it means to love God 
with your entire being. What does that require? What does that mean to love God more than anything else? He's the highest authority in our lives. All other relationships pale in comparison to our love and loyalty to Him. Everything else is subordinated to that love for God. Amen. And Jesus taught in Luke 14 that if we love anyone more than we love Him, that we cannot be His disciple. The way Jesus said that is if you try to come after me and you hate not. Some translations say love less. Hate is a strong word. It's used by Jesus on purpose in comparison to our love for God, we love less. In fact, loving God uh, is so important that if a person comes to God, a husband and a wife, and that husband stays or that wife stays in the church, and that unbelieving spouse departs, then that person is freed. Other than that, it's only a broken marriage relationship by infidelity that frees you to remarry. But Jesus, the Bible, gives us the Bible, not the words of Jesus here, the Bible gives us this, this uh, exception clause, if you will, because we are to love him above every other relationship. That's it's challenging and strong. The second commandment is related to the, the first commandment, verse 39, and the second, Jesus said, is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, to say that it is likened to it means that it is similar to it in importance. So, you know, we like to say, well, which one do you need to follow? Should you follow the first commandment or should you follow the second commandment? Well, they go together, right? They're integrated. One is part of the other. One reflects the other. They're mutually dependent. One, one kind of shows that you're obeying or disobeying the other. Love your neighbor as yourself. So if you do not love yourself in a healthy way, love your neighbor as yourself, as yourself. No man, Paul said in Ephesians, ever hated himself. We, we take care of ourselves, sometimes in vain ways, right? We think about ourselves. We don't like to admit it, but we think about ourselves first, unless we work on it. To be selfless doesn't come naturally, generally. If you know somebody that is naturally selfless, God bless them, that's an awesome thing. But typically it's a choice and it takes a lot of work. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this goes back to what I said earlier about an acceptance that we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not a self-love of vanity, but a, a respect that God loves us and we can be content with who we are. I don't want to get into this tonight, but many years ago in my youth ministry days, I've taught about this in, in teaching on completing Christ and preaching on this. You know, everybody's got their flaws and deficits. And if some of you don't get over being short, you're never going to be complete in Christ. If some of you don't get over being bald-headed, you're never going to be complete in Christ. And if being the perfect specimen physically is what makes you complete in Christ, I'm in deep trouble. And I hate to tell you, but so are you. Most of you. But I'm glad that that's not, that's not the commodity that matters to God. I can be content with who I am regardless of my flaws. Years ago, in the years of the youth division, I was young, and, but we traveled a lot for the, for the work of God. And so I would get on airplanes and I would see business people and a, a lot of them were a lot cooler looking than I was, you know. And I just remember thinking one day, I'm so thankful that God called me to do this. Because in the business world, I may not succeed by what is expected of me physiologically, what I should look like or act like or charisma. I thank God that the Lord looks on the heart. He sees something different in our lives. Amen. And having all of that physical perfection, whatever that is, no one really has it, doesn't make you complete. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you do not have a healthy love for yourself, then you typically are going to blame your flaws on God, and you will not love God like you should because you'll think he did you wrong. If self-rejection has caused you to reject God because you question 
His love for you, it is possible that you're going to reject other people as a reflection of your self-rejection. Someone said, the trouble I'm having with you is the trouble I'm having with me. I'm not sure that's always true, but I think it's often true. If you do not love God and yourself in a healthy way, qualifying for the 19th time, it is probable, you know, that if you hate yourself, you'll hate your neighbor as you hate yourself. Because you've got an, you've got an incorrect standard of judging yourself, and you'll have an incorrect standard of judging other people. And you shouldn't judge other people. Nor should you judge yourself in terms of performance, ability, and all of that. On Sunday, we judged ourselves in communion in our right relationship with God. If you hate yourself, then you see other people as competition or threats to you instead of people that you can love as Christ loved you and died for you and them. Loving God and having His favor on our lives requires us to clear any relational clutter that is accumulated in our lives. Jesus said, love God with all your being, heart, soul, mind in that passage. Love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments. Hang all the law. This is verse 40 now. Sorry on the screens. Thank you, media. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. So I think you already have this visually, but if you want to sum up what God was doing in the entire Old Testament, He was teaching us to love God first and love our neighbor as ourselves. That is the sum of God's work in the Bible, the law and the prophets. Loving God with your whole being, loving your neighbor as yourself. And if you live by these two values, you will not accumulate relational clutter in your life. You will empty the trash of broken relationships as soon as possible. Amen. Relationships matter to God. They matter deeply to God. Our relationship with God, ourselves, other people. So we need to deal with the unresolved the, the, the clutter, rather, of unresolved conflict when it is in our power to make peace. Romans 12, 18. I wanted to put this verse here to take the sword out of your hand. Because we would like to say it's not my fault. I tried, and perhaps you did, and I'm not judging you in that respect. Romans 12, 18, if it be possible, I like that. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, as much as it's up to you, live peaceably with all men. When I read that verse slowly and think about it, it sounds like it isn't just a random text message one time and say, well, I've done my duty. It sounds to me like there's a lot more work involved in if it be possible. As much as lieth in you. That it takes a lot of work to live peaceably with all men. Now, this to me, unresolved, resolving conflict, is unforgiven offenses that you have suffered. In case you miss what I mean by that. That means if someone has wronged you and you have not forgiven them, there's clutter in your life that must be addressed. You must, biblically, not Pastor John's, biblically, you must forgive them. Many scriptures about this, 70 times 7, if you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. I'm not trying to go that deep in that one aspect tonight. So we need to let go and forgive others who have wronged us. But also, unrepented or un, unrepented wrongs 
that you may have inflicted on other people. Things that you've said or done to other people that you haven't taken care of. You haven't tried. It's not as much as lieth in you. There were, it was possible for you to do something else or do something at all to make amends for what you did wrong. I'll get to this later unless I run out of time. But there's no statute of limitations on this. You can't just wait 52 years and it goes away. You have to act on that wrong you've inflicted on that other person. And you should forgive those who have wronged you. Amen. Bitterness, that accumulation of unforgiveness. Jealousy toward other people and inordinate desire to have what another person has coveting them. You know, what they possess. The second table of the law. You know, on this commandment hang all the law and the prophets. The Ten Commandments, 1 through 4, loving God. Commandments 5 through 10, loving your neighbor as yourself. That's what those commandments spell out. Amen. So, I want to talk about this connection between religion and relationships. Religion and relationship. So I want to go to the Sermon on the Mount. That's our text tonight. Pardon my uh, dry, dry throat. You're not supposed to say that for the online audience and the archives, but you're, the, you're my main audience. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus contrasted the external requirements of the Old Testament law with the higher requirements, the internal requirements of the coming kingdom, what we would call the New Testament. Now, God's nature never changes. He was never happy with lip service. He was never happy with people who didn't kill but hated, who didn't commit adultery but lusted. That was never right. But in the Old Testament, it typically dealt with the actions of sin. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes the law to a higher level. He doesn't lower the standard in the New Testament. He actually raises the standard. You've heard it said of them of old time, don't commit this act. But I say to you, you've got to look at the spirit behind that act that drives that behavior. Because the attitude matters as well. That's, that's the Sermon on the Mount. Now the law proved that we were sinners and couldn't please God in ourselves alone. It was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Matthew 5 and 20, I believe, is the heart, the key verse of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. You want to read three chapters in the Bible that will kind of give you a real synopsis of the values of the kingdom of God. Read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 5 and 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Now it would be very difficult to exceed the righteous behavior of the scribes and Pharisees. Fasting twice a week. Living by rigorous regulations, adherence to the law, imposition of things that you had to live by. Pharisees were the separated ones, the ultra conservatives, if you will. And our righteousness must exceed theirs, Jesus said. So I don't think that means we have to pray more hours or fast more days. But I don't know really anyone who doesn't need to fast more. Or pray more. But that was not the point. The point was that their righteousness was superficial. If you read Matthew 23, Jesus takes them to task about their superficial religiosity. Okay? And our righteousness has to go to a deeper level. It has to affect our relationships. We can't just come to church and sing our songs and act religious 
We have to be right with God and right with people. That's what religion is. Religion and relationships are inextricably tied together by the Lord and His Word. Amen. Now the Bible gives examples of people who claim religion while at the same time wrecking relationships. They're religious people who mistreated widows and orphans. They devoured widows' houses, the Bible says. Pure religion and undefiled, right, is to take care of widows and orphans. There were religious people who exploited the poor, charging exorbitant interest rates, taking advantage of poor people. You remember the widow who was going to be sold into slavery for debts her husband had accumulated. Maybe he was justified legally, but no mercy was shown to this poor woman. There are religious people, then and now, but there are, I say are as in now, who abuse and violate their children, who commit incest, who call themselves Christians. There are husbands and wives, but there are husbands that don't seem to be able to get a prayer through to God because they violated what 1 Peter 3, 7 says, to honor your wife as the weaker vessel and as an heir together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. I think verse 7 summarizes 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, and it can cut both ways to husband and wife, but it's specifically addressed to the husband, 1 Peter 3, 7. What a great marriage passage. And a great holiness passage. There are religious people who rob God in tithes and offerings. There are religious people who hate in the name of religion. And I don't mean that they hate evil or they hate the devil. They hate other people. There are church people who hate other church people. Holier than thou is a biblical phrase, by the way. There are people who give lip service to God while living with heaps of relational clutter. Now, we believe in speaking in tongues. We will never disparage it. Paul said, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. Jude 20 But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in a known tongue edifieth himself. We believe in speaking in other tongues a lot. But it is not God's hall pass, God's seal of approval on your unforgiving spirit. It is not God's seal of approval on your sin. It just means that in that moment, you've surrendered to the Spirit. But you can't say that that justifies violating the Word of God. Right. You know that. I know you know that. Jesus taught us to not be superficial in our our, our religion. Amen. And, And he merged, that's probably a poor term, Religion and relationships in his teachings. It was God's plan all along that relationships are spiritual. Religion and relationships go together. So Matthew 5.21. Matthew 5.21. You have heard it said, excuse me, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, Old Testament, thou shalt not kill. And whoever shall kill, shall be in danger of judgment. Remember I told you, Sermon on the Mount, taking the law to a higher level. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. I know if not long ago I used this verse, and I'll mention a couple things about it, but it's in the context of where I'm going. Angry with his brother without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, Raka, whatever, shall be in danger of the council. Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, 
shall be in danger of hell fire. And the New Living Translation says if you call someone an idiot, and I heard that somebody got in trouble and they're not going to say idiot anymore or stupid or raka, they're going with raka. It means empty brain. That's what R-A-C-A, your Bible, means empty brain. But we have other ways of saying that. If you want to, don't do this. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> never mind. Just say Reka and then they won't know what you mean. You know? But God will, God will. And I, I just put this in my notes because it's been a long time since I've talked about slang. But there's a lot of slang that makes it way in, its way into our vocabulary. We teach that cursing is a sin and why does a certain word become a curse word? Why is it wrong? And substitute words. We need to clean up our language. Amen? And I'm not thinking of a particular person, but I hear quite a bit of slang here and there. Let's just clean it up. In Jesus' name. Back to our regular sponsored program. Matthew 5.22. Now we're on verse 23. Matthew 5.23. Therefore, here's where we're going, our text. If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thou, thy brother hath ought against thee. Now the Bible teaches both ways, that you're there, and you remember that someone's got something against you, and we're going to assume from the Bible here that you did the wrong, okay? Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First, he's putting relationship ahead of religious act right here. See that? You're going to do something spiritual, but you've got something relational hanging over your head. He says, hold everything. Stop. Go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. I started imagining this in real time. Someone's up leading worship. All of a sudden, you see them put the mic down and walk away. Suddenly, the scriptures don't change on the screen. You're bringing your faith promise, your move the mission, your Christmas for Christ offering to the altar. And as you're laying it on the altar, which we appreciate, thank God for it. It makes a difference in the kingdom of God. But this is what Jesus is saying. While you're doing something very sacrificial and religious, while you're in the act of doing something spiritual, like, ah, don't you hate it when you remember things like that? When you're trying to be so good? Does God prompt that memory? I don't know. It doesn't say that. It just says you're there doing the most spiritual thing you've ever done, the biggest offering you've ever given, whatever, you know. It's having a little fun with the imagery here. And like, ooh, put on the brake, stop. Man, what are you supposed to do? Jesus said, don't take it with you and change your mind. Leave it there. I'm just reading the Bible. Leave there thy gift before the altar. It's not this or that. It's this and that, right? Say, hold on. Don't, don't put that in the offering bucket yet. I'll put that in the safe yet. I'll put that in the bank yet. I've got some unfinished business. And it sounds to me like God doesn't want it yet. Because he doesn't like it when we try to separate religion and relationships. He doesn't like it when we've got our cute little boxes. And this is the church box, and this is the people box. And they're not connected. And that's the point of these two great commandments. They're interdependent. They go together. One reflects how you are in the other one. So, go make it right with that person. So, again, it assumes that you're at fault. You go your way. You make things right. 
There you go, across the aisle, across the church, out the door, making a call. An hour later, you're back. We're all home. The lights are out, and there's your gift laying there. But you've got peace with God because as much as possible, as much as it is in you, you did what you could to make it right, and you dealt with the clutter, the relational clutter in your life. So I know you know this, worship is important, sacrifice is important, but no amount of sacrifice can excuse disobedience. That's why the Lord told Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. And God doesn't look the other way and ignore our relational clutter while taking our treasure or our time or our talent and I'm not trying to get you to live on a guilt trip where you feel unworthy. I dealt with this earlier. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're complete in Christ. We all come with our imperfection and serve the Lord with integrity. I'm not talking about with hypocrisy or immorality, uh, you know, ungodliness in our life, but imperfection. We're all imperfect. And so the Lord wants both, not one or the other. Love God, love people. Clear the emotional clutter in your life. I said wife, but that would be true too, so Freudian slip. Matthew 5, 25, Jesus goes on. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary, we've got a different relationship here, not a brother, it's an adversary, deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt... By no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Now, I taught on this some time back, and uh, in fact, that message on, I don't hate nobody. I went into this a little detail. So I'll just tell you that Jesus is not really trying to give you legal advice here. He's making a point. Get it right as soon as possible. There are consequences for dragging it out. Turn over to the judge, the officer thrown in prison. Whether the allegations are true or false, there's a penalty. Agree with thine adversary quickly while you're in the way with him. The apostle Paul told us something similar in Ephesians 4, 26. Be angry and sin not. Now, I'm going to pause right here, not in my notes. I've taught on this before. I read a wonderful thing years ago uh, and I learned it and it's, it's amazing. Be angry and sin not. Now, when you genuinely love someone, you're probably not on the verge of sinning. Love and sin are far apart. But Paul says, be angry and sin not. Because when you're angry, you may call it righteous indignation, but when you're angry, you're pretty close, maybe, to sin. So he gives us this warning, this, you know, if you're angry, be careful. Be angry and sin not. Because anger and sin are not miles apart. And then, the point that I want to make tonight, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't accumulate relational clutter in your life. That's the point. Jesus made it. Paul made it. In other words, God made this point. That if you allow this to accumulate in your life, it will destroy you and it affects your relationship with God. Then verse 27, neither give place to the devil. Now Ephesians 4, there's a lot of one-liners and independent thoughts. But I think these verses are connected together. Don't give place to the devil. Don't allow him to get a foothold in your life by not reconciling relationships as soon as possible. The longer we let an offense fester, the more poison accumulates in our hearts and spirits. There's some things you should sleep on, like before sending somebody an email or a letter that you may wish later you hadn't sent. But in this case, the Bible says don't sleep on anger. Don't sleep on unresolved relationships. Don't go to bed angry with your spouse or children. Forgive and be forgiven. Clear the relational clutter in your life 
the longer you wait, the more difficult it is to get it right. When you forgive, forgiveness frees you from the magnetic pull of hate. I read an article today, I'd like to think about it longer, it's a little bit older, 2008, and they did brain waves on hate and love and how the emotions are very similar with love and hate. I've always believed that love and hate, the two strongest powers humanly, and maybe the passion of them is very similar, and I was surprised to stumble on that. I saved the article, and I'm not making it a teaching point, but, but hatred is very powerful. Love is very powerful. Withholding forgiveness doesn't punish the offender, it punishes you. And when you release the one who offended you, you are free, and then they are in the hands of God. When we're forgiven, we're set free from that offense. When we forgive others, we release that person to settle up with God. Now, I just want to make this comment, it's really not my theme tonight, but forgiveness and trust are different. Forgiveness should be instantaneous. Trust takes time. Someone in a relationship with you has violated trust and they want to regain it. They shouldn't demand that you instantly trust them. You should prove your trust. I've been the pastor here over 27 years. I never assume trust. I believe you earn it every day and you never quit earning it by the way you live your life. That is true of every person in every relationship. And if you demand trust when you violate it, that expectation is unrealistic. Trust takes time. Forgiveness should be instantaneous. Amen. I read that bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting on the other person to die. It doesn't destroy them. It destroys you. I know a man who's deceased now. I make this very generic. He was in a huge business arrangement with the person who's supposed to be a believer. That person defrauded him of several hundred thousand dollars. Caused bankruptcy. The business closed. And that man forgave the offense. I don't know all the legal ramifications, what happened with the business and debt or any of that. But I know he forgave him. That man that I knew and have been in his home, doesn't live in Georgia, he died very wealthy and right with God. I know another man who years ago was wronged in a business deal and he got out of church in the process of time. I'm not sure it was over that. But later he forgave, came back to God, is serving God today. I had a conversation with this man. Be, be careful that you, know, you don't get taken advantage of and, and get burned in business and and, and have that same thing happen to you. And that man looked at me and said, that will never happen again. I'm a different person. I will never let someone who wrongs me cause me to lose out with God again. And there are people in this room right now who have been deeply offended and hurt in their lives, wronged by leaders, wronged by other people. But because of their own soul's sake, they did not allow clutter to develop in their life. I've known good godly people who got angry and hurt in situations and maybe for a while struggled with that but they eventually overcame it and they cleared that clutter out of their life they lived and died in a right relationship with God that's what I want for myself and that's what I want for you 